Rick Flair's professional wrestling career began in 1972 in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, where he wrestled George Scrap Iron Gadaski. The fight ended in a draw after 10 minutes, and from that moment on, Richard Morgan Flair would forever be known as Rick Flair. By 1974, Flair had become a massive hit among wrestling fans, and before long he was winning championship after championship. So, how could someone that made millions of dollars throughout the 80s and 90s have tarnished his reputation while almost going entirely broke in the process? You could say that it all started when Ric Flair adopted the Nature Boy gimmick. Anyone who saw Ric Flair during the height of his career could see that he was living the lavish lifestyle that he portrayed when he was in the ring. This meant riding around in limos and private jets, going to casinos to blow a ton of money and wearing the most expensive clothes. The former heavyweight champion was also known for his expensive taste in luxury vehicles. From owning a 1999 Bentley Arnage T to demanding that his Uber driver gets a different car before picking him up. That's right, Ric Flair ordered an Uber, and when his driver showed up in a Kia, at first Flair thought it was just a fan stopping to greet him. But once he realized that it was supposed to be his ride, he allegedly told the driver, the world champion doesn't ride in Kias, so get a effing town car, get a Cadillac, and come back. And if that's an example of the sort of lifestyle that the nature boy was trying to live, it's no wonder that he started to lose all his money. Reckless spending wasn't the only cause for Ric Flair going from rich and famous to practically broke and homeless. It turns out the wrestler ended up becoming enemies with the IRS, and on multiple occasions was forced to pay back hundreds of thousands of dollars that he owed. According to the reports, it started during the 1980s while Flair was earning roughly $700,000 per year. And I'm not sure if it was because he didn't know how the system works or not, but the wrestler decided not to pay any taxes during that entire decade. That could easily have been considered tax evasion, which Al Capone would tell you is a big no-no. And in the 1990s, the IRS ended up going after Rick for all that he owed. Now, because of the amount of money that the wrestler was earning annually, he was able to pay a fine of $62,000 to cover what he owed from 1982 and 83. But that wasn't the last time that he had a run-in with the IRS. As I said before, the two became enemies. In 2005, it was reported that the IRS was seizing Ric Flair's earnings in order to pay back more money that he owed in taxes. And you would think that after two times he would have learned his lesson and begun to file his taxes properly. But even as recently as 2019, Flair ended up being served a notice that informed him that he owed $280,000 in back taxes. On top of legal trouble with the IRS, Ric Flair also had issues with his five ex-wives, the most public of which was his second wife, Elizabeth Harrell. The two went through a nasty divorce that exposed a whole new side of Flair to the world. There were reports that Ric even went as far as opening a wound on his forehead so that when the police came during an argument, it would make Beth look bad. And if that wasn't the worst of it, according to his ex-wife, Flair would often expose himself to his friends and others around him. The wrestler also ended up getting into a physical altercation with their son while attending a wedding at one point. When all of this came to light, the public began to view Flair differently than they had in the past, with many believing that he was blurring the lines between who he was in real life and the wrestling persona that he put on while in the ring. Then there was the Ric Flair finance program debacle that not only left the former champion's finances in pieces, but caused a lot of legal trouble for him as well. Ric Flair Finance was intended to be an online financial company that had been set up by the professional wrestler and his business partner, Chris Porter. Their entire business model essentially centered around their company being the middlemen between customers and lenders. The pair expected Ric Flair Finance to be a huge success, so much so that they sunk a large sum of money into advertisements for their company and had them on air on WWE television, as well as before NASCAR race that took place in Delaware. But what Flair, or Porter, failed to realize was that their business model was illegal. Ric Flair Finance needed to apply for a broker's license in order to act as the middleman like they intended to, and that was something that they'd failed to do. According to the wrestler, his partner told him that they didn't need a broker's license, and because they didn't act fast enough, the company was shut down. But Ric's issues with his business partner didn't end there, though. Years later, Porter would end up suing Flair for $115,000 after Rick neglected to pay back a loan that Chris had granted him. Sadly, this was something that the wrestler was known for, taking out a loan and not paying it back. Sometimes he would even offer up his possessions as collateral. For instance, while he was still with his third wife, Tiffany Vandermark, the two apparently met with a restaurateur named Greg Leon to discuss getting a loan from him. 
During the conversation, Flair offered up the engagement ring that Tiffany was wearing at the time as collateral. That's insane. And I guess a friend of Leon's felt the same way because she convinced him to not take the ring as collateral. Instead, Flair gave him a boat, a motorcycle, and a Rolex watch in order to take the loan out. In case you think that sounds like fair collateral, it should also be noted that none of the vehicles came with their proper title, which meant that Greg Leon hasn't been able to sell them to pay for the loan that Flair never paid back. The former heavyweight champion even went as far as putting his National Wrestling Association belt up for collateral, not once, but twice. And that wasn't discovered until High Spots, the merchandise company, went to sell the belt that they had received as collateral from Ric Flair. They legally couldn't sell it. It turned out that Flair had used the exact same belt as collateral with another company he reportedly owed an even bigger sum of money. It's clear that Richard Morgan Flair could never take himself away from his Ric Flair lifestyle, despite not even being able to afford it while he was in his prime. What do you think? Is there ever going to be a comeback for Ric Flair? Or has he missed his many opportunities? Let us know in the comments below.